All right, welcome. I'm uh, John Nielsen. First time presenting here. I've been uh, to the conference a couple times. Um, yeah, we're going to get started. Maybe have some extra time for questions or demos or break afterwards. We'll see. Um, this is me. Grew up in the 80s mostly. Had a TI-99-4A in the home. It's the first computer. Uh, got on a FreeBSD late 90s. Thought it was uh, much better than the HP UX I had at school at the time. Um, did computer science at BYU. Master's at uh, UNC Charlotte. And despite that, been doing kind of systems admin rather than programming basically my whole career. I currently work for Domo, which does business intelligence and analytics as a service. Um, make pretty pictures, upload all your data. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank them for sponsoring my travel. Um, things I really like are virtualization, uh, networking, especially on the host side, and um, storage, again, especially on the host side. I'd rather do things on a box I can control than on a, a black box SAN or a, a router, given the performance. Um, let's learn about you. Who's uh, here for the first time? Here to be as you can. Welcome. Uh, who's used VXLAN before? Who's uh, wishing there was more room in Dr. McCusick's hall? OK, good. Um, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I guess raise the hands. Who's kind of planning to use VXLAN in their work or, or something? Depends on the <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other um, you know, reasons you you're wanted, to, wanted to learn about it? Just because just it's cool? Yes? Good. Good, okay. We'll talk about that for sure. Okay. Yeah, a couple different ways to do that. We'll show some of that. All right. Um, let's do kind of an overview, then I'll do a little more uh, detail later. So VXLAN is Virtual Extensible Local Area Network. Um, it's similar in spirit to VLANs. Similar in execution to tunnels, kind of uh, get some, some benefits and improvements on both. There's a 24-bit identifier called a VNI. So you can have actually up to, what is it, 16 million uh, VXLANs on the same underlying IP network. Um, you only set up a tunnel on one side. It's a virtual tunnel, and then they discover each other. Uh, Hosts are therefore called virtual tunnel endpoints, or VTEPs. You'll see that a lot if you read about VXLAN online. Um, BUM traffic, broadcast unicone, unicast, or multicast is sent to all, everybody on the VNI via multicast. Otherwise, things are sent directly, uh, unicast. Um, I'm sure, review for most of you, I stole the graphic from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. But uh, IP protocol layer. You know, normally without tunneling, you've got uh, Ethernet frame at the bottom, layer two in the OSI terms, the network layer, the IP header, layer three, uh, layer four in OSI terms is TCP or UDP with its own header, and layer five is the application data payload. Uh, VXLAN uh, tunnels a layer two frame inside of a UDP packet, so we've kind of at the top of the stack twice. Um, so basically, inside your VXLAN packet, you have a VXLAN header, and then the original frame from your client or from your interface, depending on uh, where your VXLAN interface is getting its data from. So I mean, conceptually, not, not that hard. I uh, you can maybe tell it's, it's zoomed in on the original graphic there, but. Um, yeah, you take your original frame, prepend the VXLAN header, wrap it in a new outer UDP, uh, and then IP packet, and then uh, Ethernet or whatever your underlying network is. It doesn't have to be Ethernet. And that's what you'll see on the wire. Um, kind of some background comparing to VLAN and tunnels. Uh, again, because they're kind of all related. So VLAN is virtual local area network, been around for a while. It's a layer two technology, multiplexes up to about 4,000 VLANs on the same Ethernet segment. Um, if your switch is going to participate, which 
it basically has to. It needs to support VLANs. But it's been around for a while. Most quality switches do support VLANs, uh, kind of a key technology in a data center or even a corporate or a lot of home networks. So problems with VLAN, um, it has to be Ethernet. And it has to be the same Ethernet. If you want you know, VLANs on one side of the data center and VLAN, same VLANs on the other side of the data center, you've got to have the same Ethernet switch, Ethernet segment trunked all the way across your data center. Um, you can't go across the router and inspect to keep your VLAN tag. Uh, there is a limit of 4,000 VLANs, and some switches have much lower limits. Not to hit on VLANs, I use them all the time, but um, that's kind of some reasons you might want to look for something else. Tunnels, a lot of different kinds of tunnels. Point to point connection between two endpoints. Um, usually it's a layer two over layer three, or layer three over layer four, or some other combination. But um, again, you probably use them if you have a VPN. You uh, <laughs> connect in, you've got your layer two or layer three traffic for your inner network, the secure network transmitted over the outer network, the insecure internet, for example, uh, PPP, GRE, Ether IP, uh, layer two tunneling protocol. All examples of this you know, way of doing a tunnel, d certainly different technologies, but uh, have some similar traits. Uh, it's great for a VPN, especially in a star topology, if you've got your office, a bunch of road warriors connecting in. They don't necessarily want to talk to each other, but they all want to talk to the office network. That's fine. Uh, where it starts to break down is if you're adding lots of nodes and you want tunnels between all of them. So a, a full mesh topology. Um, and it's, in, in fact, an exponential number of tunnels that you need as you grow the number of nodes to keep a full mesh. So, you know, four endpoints, not so bad. You got six tunnels in between them. Ten endpoints, 45, 100 endpoints, 5,000 almost. And it's uh, then using those tunnels or deciding how to use them is its own uh, nightmare in itself. Um, there are some protocols like Trill that uh, aim to do that, but it's, it's still kind of a lot of overhead. You've got to configure the tunnel on both ends, you know, to find each other. And then you need a routing protocol or, again, trail or something else to figure out which tunnel you're going to use for which traffic. And if you just use um, something like Spanning Tree, then you're going to have all these tunnels and only use a handful of them until one of them goes down. And that's not always going to be the best route for your traffic. Uh, so VXLAN solves a lot of these problems. It scales linearly. You configure a host once. Uh, you want to add more hosts, you configure the other host, you don't need to come back to the first host at all. Um, you want to add more tunnels, great, you just add that VNI to all your VTEPs. Um, and it handles the forwarding problem for you. It, it learns a lot like a switch. Each VTEP has its own forwarding table. So, um, again, except for that bum traffic, you VTEPs communicate directly with each other via unicast uh, in the shortest route possible. You don't need support on your switch. You can have a switch, a bunch of different switches. Don't need to know or care about VXLAN. You can just use it on your end hosts, and it'll work great. And you don't even need switches or Ethernet. You could use InfiniBand, wireless, or something more esoteric. Um, and it still looks like Ethernet to the inner network, but the underlying network just needs IP and multicast support. Uh, again, 24-bit VNI, so that's 16 million versus only 4,000 VLANs. Um, there are a couple drawbacks or things to keep in mind. Um, each segment needs to support multicast. If you're going to cross a router, you need to do multicast routing. So that's, uh, depending on the environment, can be a caveat. If you're a single organization, you're already doing your own routing. Not a big deal, usually. And there are some ways to do it without multicast. Um, for example, the Docker implementation uses a key value store like etcd, and it just looks things up in that to find out which host to talk to for a given MAC address. Um, OpenStack has its own kind of non-multicast layer two flooding methods. But again, in my experience, multicast isn't too bad, either a single IP network or you support your own routing and can route the multicast as well. There's some overhead, like with many tunnel tunneling protocols. 50 bytes 
Typically, it comes out of your MTU. So you either have a larger MTU on your underlying network, or you need to have a smaller MTU on the inner network. I usually do, if I can, 9216 on the networking gear, and then it doesn't really matter what the MTU is on the inner. It can be the default 1500, it can be 9000, and there's still plenty of overhead for the uh, tunnel, uh, the extra headers in the tunnel. There is some CPU cost to it, depending on your hardware. Um, though there are VXLAN offloading NICs and drivers, and then some switches, again, are starting to support VXLAN as well. So a little more detail. Um, so on a host, you want to use a v particular VNI. You create one VXLAN interface per VNI. Uh, give it a name, that identifier, and a multicast group address. You can use the interface directly if you want to put an IP address on it, for example. Or you can add it to a bridge um, to you know, put your, your jail interface in, your virtual machine interface in, or something else. It could just be a, you could bridge a VLAN with a VXLAN and have it be a you know, kind of forwarding station. Uh, the host, again, maintains a forwarding table for each interface individually. So when it sees a packet come in, it looks at the outer IP address and the inner MAC address, the source, saves that. So next time it needs to send a packet to that MAC address, it knows which VTEP peer, uh, which outer IP address to use for a, a unicast uh, transmission. A uh, little graphic from Cisco, kind of repeating what we had before. There's your original L2 frame, gets a VXLAN header, then it gets an, a new outer UDP header, IP header, and if you're on Ethernet, a MAC frame header and footer. Just to kind of walk through sending a VXLAN. So you bring up your interface, you um, either put an IP address on it and say ping out it, or bridge it with a virtual machine, the virtual machine sends traffic. And in any case, the traffic comes in on this inner network, the VXLAN interface. You've got a Mac frame, Ethernet frame. Stick the VXLAN header on it, add the UDP header, check the destination Mac address. If it's in the forwarding table for that VXLAN interface, then we're going to use the peer IP that we've got saved. Otherwise, we're going to use the multicast group IP that's already configured when you bring up the VXLAN interface. Um, you can then get a full you know, new IP packet. You send it out your, your layer two with an Ethernet frame over the outer network. Uh, other direction, when, once that happens, it gets the peer. It receives this encapsulated packet on the outer network, the underlying IP network. Um, strips off the Ethernet, assuming you're using Ethernet for layer two. We've got an IP packet. We're going to take a look at the source IP. Uh, UDP, take a look at the VXLAN header, figure out which VNI this goes to. If we've got an interface with that VNI, we'll deliver it to that interface. Then we're left with the inner um, Ethernet frame, the original frame from the client on the other side. We uh, update our local forwarding table, say, hey, this came from this peer. It's got this source MAC address. If I need to send anything there in the future, that's where it goes. But then it's just delivered on the inner network. So again, to the VXLAN interface or through the bridge to whatever it's um, talking to. Any questions on that? Mostly making sense. All right. Um, so we're going to use it. It's been an open BSD for, I think, three years now, since 5.5. FreeBSD 10.2 last year added it. Uh, Linux has had it for a couple of years. Come on They've um, you know fixed some bugs along the way. So if you're using Linux, the kernel 3.10 is uh, is recommended. VMware has had it for uh, a while. They're actually part of the initial group of companies that designed the VXLAN uh, protocol, and some hardware supports it as well. Cisco, Arista, uh, Juniper, Mellanox, one of our sponsors, have some VXLAN support in their, in their switch gear. Uh, Docker, if you use Docker, you don't even need 
the new Linux kernel, Docker has a user land implementation um, that happens to use VXLAN and kind of hides a lot of the details from the uh, end user. A um, couple things to, to keep in mind as you're using VXLAN. You're going to want to um, use a different group address for each identifier. Um, use the official port and uh, adjust the firewall. So the, the VNI, some implementations just say, hey, let's use 224.0.0.1 for everything. Um, OpenStack did that for a while. Uh, but that's not a good idea for a few reasons. You, Let's say you've got 10 networks. If they're all using the same group address, they're all seeing all the traffic for all the networks, even if you've only got one or two networks you're interested in that you actually have hosts on. So if you use a different multicast address for each VNI, then you only see the traffic you're interested in on that, on that host, on that VTAP. Um, just so happens that 239-8 is reserved for organization local. So that's 24 bits. We've got 24 bits of VNI. You can easily do a one domain mapping um, between those two. So I typically convert the VNI to hex, you know, stick a 239 in front of it, convert it back to decimal, and there's your address. For example, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8 becomes 239, 188, 9, 7, 7, 8. And that's pretty straightforward. You can do it on a shell script or whatever you're using. Um, again, just each, each two bit, two bytes, nibbles, I guess they are, <laughs> um, becomes a, each byte becomes an octet in your multicaster group. There it is. Uh, and this, you know, you can copy from the slides when I get them posted. Um, you're going to want to use the official port. The INA has assigned 4789 as the UDP port for VXLAN. Um, Linux, in particular, did not use this initially. Uh, they had their own 7, sorry, 8472. Um, so if you're interoperating with Linux, you want to check that. If you're doing a new implementation that includes Linux, you're going to want to specify the port, um, you know, desk port 4789 when you make that interface. Um, otherwise, just don't worry about it. OpenBSD and FreeBSD use the default uh, out of the box. Then the firewall is something you have to think twice about because it's tunneled. Um, things are potentially firewalled twice. So on the outer network, if you want to allow your VXLAN through, you need to allow UDP to your VTEP on 4789 or whichever port you're using. You also need to allow UDP from other hosts to the multicast address or the multicast range. And if you take my suggestion, that's you know 239 slash 8 um, as the destination that you would allow in your firewall. Uh, it's bitten me at least half a dozen times. I'll bring up a VXLAN interface and not get a ping response and have to figure out why it's not coming in. And that's usually why, because I didn't allow the multicast. So I don't get the ART packets, but then if I ping both directions and they populate, then it magically works. And I wait. OK, so the multicast isn't working, but the unicast is. Um, in a network, you can treat it just like a regular interface. So it's a VXLAN and some number interface, whatever you'd normally apply, if any. Uh, for testing, you can start with it, uh, you know, open up and then lock it down. So how, how and why and where are you going to use this? Uh, it was introduced for virtual machines, but there are some other uh, interesting use cases, especially on a BSD, that we can, we can talk about. Uh, first of all, virtual machines are, again, kind of the big reason for this. Um, if you've got a cloud hosting provider, multi-tenant situation, a lot of customers in the same data center on the same network gear, you don't want to be configuring VLANs every time you bring up a new network. You don't want to limit yourself to 4,000 customer networks. You don't want to have all of your hypervisors on the same subnet or the same Ethernet segment. So you can use VXLAN and say, all right, each row or each rack of servers gets its own subnet. Uh, we can have millions of these customer networks. We um, don't need to configure the switch every time we add one. And uh, we don't need to overload hosts with traffic they're not interested in. Because um, again, each host only listens on 
the group multicast address associated with the VNI for the VXLANs it has configured. And you don't need switch support, you just need to route that multicast traffic if you're doing multiple subnets. I uh, hope you can see this, talk through it a little bit. This is just one way to do it. Um, this is actually how we did it the first place that I used VXLAN at my previous job. Uh, we had, actually had an InfiniBand IP network, but we wanted to use, you know, regular TAP interfaces for our virtual machines. Uh, we also had virtual routers per customer. So then we had um, kind of a, a gateway box that had, you know, talk BGP to the upstream router, had some VXLAN <coughs> downstream interfaces, and then just 10 gig Ethernet upstream, uh, VXLAN over IPOIB in, in that example. But whatever the, the IP network is for the hypervisors, um, you know, again, as long as it's IP and supports multicast, it'll work. So then each hypervisor can have whichever VXLAN interfaces it cares about. Hypervisor 1 has customer A and a router, so it needs a public network in red. Hypervisor 2 has customer B and its router. Hypervisor 3 doesn't have the public network, but it has machines from both customer A and customer B. So customer A, you know, the two VMs can talk to each other as if they're on the same Ethernet because they're on the same VXLAN. Uh, the VM can talk to the internet by using its uh, customer router. This has got a public IP and goes to the gateway box. Same thing for customer B. Talk to its virtual router, can talk to its peer. If customer A wants to talk to customer B, it has to go through the router. But you can do that, set up firewalls or not. Um, and again, think of this on a much larger scale. You're going to have dozens or hundreds of VNIs on each hypervisor and uh, dozens or hundreds of hosts, each with a similar setup. Alternatively, you could uh, have everything route through a physical hardware router as long as it supported VXLAN. You wouldn't necessarily need these um, router VMs, but you would need a gateway on each VXLAN that you wanted to uh, allow internet access to. You could, of course, also have a private network that's not hooked up to a gateway, and that would route the same uh, over the underlying network as anything else. Uh, another useful scenario is uh, extending Ethernet to you know, more exciting uh, places. If you want to bridge, if you want to use a bridge interface on um, you know, a Linux or a BSD box, the interfaces you add to it need to be Ethernet or at least look like they're Ethernet to be added. So InfiniBand is out, a wireless station is out, unless you want to do Harry MAC address NAT, um, which is why I said easily versus not. Uh, a lot of other things, point to point links, don't really you know, fall in that model. But if you just have you know, a VXLAN, you can add a VXLAN to a bridge, um, you know, no problem. So uh, I actually did this, my, the last place I lived, I set up a wireless access point, had a, a little Alex box, it was a wireless station, and then bridged its Ethernet port to my core network by um, configuring a VXLAN on top of the wireless link. And instead of bridging the wireless interfaces, bridging the VXLAN interfaces. Um, this is kind of a, a generalized diagram of that setup. So we've got core switch, doesn't know or care about VXLAN, has a couple of VLANs, two and three, uh, wireless clients on three of the green network, wired clients on blue. I've got a core access point that's hardwired to the switch. Um, it's got the VLANs, it's also got the VXLANs, two and three. And it also has a single wireless access point. Um, notice the access point is not in the bridge, but the VXLANs are bridged with the VLANs. And um, if I want you know, wireless clients, I could add that other access point to the bridge. Um, but then they've got the remote access points, whose uplink is just wireless. The station's talking to this core uh, 
access point. And again, they're not in a bridge, not least because it's really hard to add a station to a bridge, but we've got um, their own Ethernet interfaces with the VLANs and their own VXLANs. So I've got a bridge two and a bridge three on each one. I can then plug an Ethernet to a remote switch. Our wireless clients can connect directly to that uh, bridge to access point. And everything goes back to the core on the proper VLAN. Uh, even though we've got this wireless backhaul link in the middle. And again, you could scale this with multiple core access points and multiple rem remote access points per core. If you need to, it actually worked pretty well um, just for my trivial setup with uh, you know, one station, one access point. And then I was providing wireless service as well as an Ethernet jack I could plug into that wasn't actually connected by core switch, but it was on the same network. Um, another one is containers. So jails on FreeBSD, uh, especially if you're using VNet, each jail is going to have its own IP and network stack. And it's going to be isolated from the hosts. Uh, typically what you're going to do, you know, in general, is you use the, the ePair interface. One side's on the host, one side's in the jail. You can put the ePair in a bridge, excuse me, um, which is fine. Uh, if you're going to use VXLAN, it probably would be for one of a couple of reasons. Either you don't want the host to be that involved in the, uh, the jails networking, or you've got a lot of different jails and a lot of different networks, and you don't want them to necessarily mix. Uh, but you could do it two different ways. In the, in the first case, it's very similar to the virtual machine. You would bring up the ePair, add it to a bridge. Um, same like you'd add a TAP interface from a VM to, the, to a bridge with a VXLAN. Uh, second case, if, uh, if you've only got one jail on a machine that needs to be on this network, host doesn't need to know about it really at all. You bring up the VXLAN interface, enslave it directly to the jail, and then that's the jail's interface. And it, it can talk to other you know, machines on that network, whether there are other jails on other hosts, VMs on other hosts, um, machines directly on that VXLAN. Um, and the jail is doing the outer network layer, but um, you know, it doesn't have an IP on the inner network or really needs to be involved with that uh, any further. So here's again an example with both virtual machines and jails. Uh, we've got the internet, we've got our OpenBSD box doing routing uh, with some uh, two VXLANs on a 10 gig interface. You're going to have just a single IP network. The solid lines are the physical connections to the network and then the VXLANs kind of make these virtual links between you know, all the parts. So on the, on the green network, VXLAN 1, <coughs> I've got a VM on this first Beehive host. I've got two jails on this uh, other host. And they can all talk on VXLAN 1, just like it's uh, their own dedicated Ethernet. Neither of the hosts has, needs to have an IP on that, on that network. Um, and again, the VXLAN 2, the blue network, we could have another VM you know, with its TAP interface in a bridge there. And a jail just has that VXLAN 2 interface directly enslaved to it. Um, so once, once that's set up, the host doesn't even see that interface, even though it's handling the outer traffic on, um, on its 10 gig interface. Uh, yeah, and we can, uh, we can come back to that if there. Well, are there questions on? on any of this so far? All right. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, I'm a bit confused. I mean, you said that you need one VXLAN per point to point connection. And uh, now it looks like you've got uh, one VXLAN and multiple VM connections, one LAN. Do I need to configure each endpoint on every endpoint? So each there, there are two VXLANs on this slide, and yes, multiple hosts in each VXLAN, or multiple endpoints on each VXLAN. On the host, I just configure one, the VXLAN 1 with the VNI 1 or whatever, VXLAN 2 with VNI 2, and then over here I'm adding it to a bridge. Over here I'm adding one to a bridge and enslaving the other 
to the jail directly. Yes. Yes. And if, if there were you know, additional hosts, if I had a third VXLAN, but I didn't have any users of it on this host, I wouldn't need to bring up that interface at all on this host. That's uh, a good question. So all broadcast filters the multicast time is just Yes. So yeah, you can. Send broadcast over your VXLAN. Uh, DHCP works fine, for example. And when it when it's doing when it's using the multicast plus the MAC address and some other stuff, is the inside of it just looks like your standard flooding, and then the outside does the magic picture out. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the inner packet is going to be whatever the client sends. So if it's got a MAC address of you know all ones, f f f f f f. That's what it's going to see on the other on each VTEP when it receives it, and then based on that, if it's again in a bridge on that VTEP, it'll send it to everybody. Um, and if it's not, then obviously they'll just send it to the whatever's hooked up to the VXLAN interface. Good. Sorry, one last question. So, so then it's not actually the fact that it's being sent out across that multicast that gets the, the proper VXLAN address added. It's whenever a packet comes back after yes. it goes out the multicast that you think that. Yes. Okay. So yeah, in a typical, um, you know, two hosts just communicating over a VXLAN, and say you're pinging one from the other, it'll the the client sends the ARP lookup, which is the broadcast. The host uh, encapsulates that and sends it to the multicast group or whatever uh, VXLAN the, the end user is on. Um, goes out to everybody. Whoever responds. A saves the first client, a VTEP, because it saw it coming in, it had that source MAC address. And then B sends out a response, and it'll be unicast at that point, the response back. But then both hosts know about, you know, hey, this other guy has this client, the first guy has the one client. And the ping is just sent unicast, and the response is just sent unicast. So really, it's not much more overhead than typical Ethernet, because the only time you're doing a broadcast is with an ARP. And then everybody knows about each other, um, much like a switch. It just learns as it as it observes the traffic. But there's, it's not manipulating the traffic to to get more information. I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what, I swear, last question. Sure, go for it. So it's really only a doubling of overhead because you've got your ARP table inside the VM or whatever, and then an equivalently sized table for the VX plan controlling all that information where it needs to map. Uh, it may or may not be the same size, but yeah, that that information is is stored two places. Um, the yeah, the ARP table on the on the VM, for example, doesn't know it's on a VXLAN, so it's just keeping track of things on the local Ethernet, as far as it's concerned. And then yeah, the host does this mapping for each for each VXLAN interface, and you can configure the size of those tables on the host. If, uh, go ahead. I was wondering if you could uh, touch on so on the right side of that diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, Exactly. Um, on the on the left hand side though, is the, the bridge and the tap because you can't attach a VLAN one interface directly with VM one, or is that to like um, in case you have VM three now that you're going to attach and have the same configuration? It's you know what I'm saying? yeah, that's a good question. It's it's actually both um, <coughs> on Beehive and KVM for that matter. You just have a, a VNet or a tap interface on the host side that's associated with a VM. You can't, if you want it to you know, use the VXLAN to go to other hosts, then you've just got to bridge them together. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, the side benefit is if you've got a second VM on the same network on the same host, it'll be in the same bridge. It won't go over the wire to, to talk to its peer, right. its and neighbor. So if you're just running, say, one jail per VXLAN per jail host, mm -hmm. and you can bypass the bridge and the pair. Then, yeah, you just enslave the VXLAN directly to the jail. Right. Um, 
feel free to interrupt with, uh, with other questions. I'm just going to real quickly look at how you actually set things up on, uh, on FreeBSD and OpenBSD and then Linux. Uh, similar in all cases, again, you create the interface with uh, the VNI, the um, group broadcast address, sorry, multicast address, and um, the interface, and then just give it a name. I'm, pre I'm calling them all VXLAN. Uh, I think that's a requirement on FreeBSD and OpenBSD so it knows which type of interface you're using. On Linux, you can call it whatever you want because you specify the type explicitly. Um, but FreeBSD, if config, the name, create, then VXLAN ID, local, device, VXLAN group, and then it's there. You just bring it up however you want. Um, in these examples, I'm lowering the MTU just because I'm using VMs on uh, for my demos and don't have control over that outer network hardware very much. But again, if you don't want to have to mess with that, then have a large MTU on your outer network. Uh, and then you, once it's up, you can just have config to see it. It looks mostly like any other Ethernet interface, um, including an Ethernet address. And then it just has this extra line of information about the VXLAN status. Um, if you want to do that every time you boot up, add it to rc.conf. It's a cloned interface, so I just put it in there. The fact that you're calling it VXLAN tells it it's a VXLAN interface to clone. Give it create arguments with all this um, VXLAN particulars, the VNI, the um, local device and IP to use, and the group address. And then again, configure it just like any other interface with an ifconfig underscore um, and whatever parameters you want there. Uh, OpenBSD, very similar. You don't need to do the create step. It kind of does it in line for you. And it uses the tunnel syntax, uh, similar to a GRE or other <coughs> um, tunnel interface. Ifconfig xlan tunnel. Uh, your local IP, your remote IP, would in this case, which is a group multicast, and then your VNet ID. Uh, it's worth noting on both the OpenBSD and FreeBSD implementations, you can do a point-to-point -point tunnel. If you just have two VTEPs, you can specify them directly without doing multicast. Um, if, if you want to, I think, I think the beauty of it is not having to do that, but that is an option. Uh, and again, a regular if config, it's MTU, and it looks a lot like any other interface with the tunnel. And you know it's a VNet because it has a VNet ID over here. And you can put that in a, in a host name config file uh, with just the tunnel and then the regular oop, spelling correction there, INAT uh, syntax. I'm going to be OCD and fix that. Uh, Linux actually doesn't know, let's see, no distribution that I've used recently supports VXLAN config natively, but you can do it on the command line and or write your own RC script. Um, so this is how you do it, IP-link add. Again, the same information, just different syntax a little bit. Uh, yeah, and again, this will be in the slides which I, which I post up. As far as, let's see, as far as seeing it in action a little bit, well, any questions on, on configuring or other things you thought of? All right, so it's, you know, nothing too glamorous to demo other than showing it working, but we can do that if nothing broke since an hour ago. So here I've got a, a gateway box running FreeBSD. Uh, VTNet's public. Public on the wireless here. VTNet1 is, uh, is my underlying outer network. VTNet2 I'm not using. Then this VXLAN201 um, is a you know, VXLAN interface 
that this VM is acting as a gateway for. Uh, if we go to another host, I've got a, a bridge and did not get VMage compiled in time to actually show the jails, but this is what the bridge would look like. Um, so again, it's got VTNet 0 on the underlying IP network, the 100, VXLAN 201 on the 200. And this one, this guy doesn't have its own IP address. He's just in a bridge, which is a pretty typical configuration. You don't actually need an IP address on the bridge either, um, assuming your end users get their own, but it's a useful way to, to troubleshoot and make sure things are working. Um, so here I've got you know, two ePair interfaces in the bridge along with the VXLAN. So jails on the other sides of those ePairs will be on that network and just treat it like any other Ethernet network. Um, and then the B sides would be enslaved. The jails aren't running, so that they're showing up here on the host. And let's see if I broke things. Yeah, it's live. So that's using VXLAN over the underlying IP network. I go back to the host, the gateway, and look at traffic on that interface. I'm just seeing, you know, the normal ping requests and replies. If I look at traffic on the underlying interface, it's it a little bit more interesting. Um, so what are we looking at? Oh, let's see, oh because I'm messaging. Let's do this again. So, for example, this guy is from 100.1 to 100.20, which is that first client. It's UDP, port 4789, so it's VXLAN. Uh, a different version of TCP dump will actually decode the VXLAN for you. So it'll show you that's the outer, and then show you the inner is actually that ping packet, but it's uh, pretty clear what's going on there. Exactly. Yeah, so it can have its own routing table, and it, uh, again, the host of the jail doesn't even need an IP on whatever subnet the jail is using. Yeah. Which host? I mean, it, it needs to be an IP on the host. The jail doesn't need to know about it. So, um, yeah, for us, it says local here. That's a local IP on the jail host. Okay. It is associated with that VX Center interface, but when you enslave it, it doesn't mean the jail will be able to talk to that IP. It just means that when you send things out the VXLAN, that's the IP it's going to come from on the wire when the host sends it on. Okay. On, on the outer, the outer IP. I think so. Um, is a uh, Brian V's not in here, is he? No. Okay. Last time I heard, the FreeBSD needed like a couple small things to get IP6 working with VXLAN, but it certainly is a supported thing in general. Um, not sure about OpenBSD, anybody know? And uh, Linux, I believe it works on IP6. You don't have to hate yourself too much, but <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just a little. That's right. Hello. Yeah. The other way, the other way around, though, will work out of the box. Though. 
Um, yeah, if you wanted your client to use IP6, it's no problem. As long as the host has IP4 and it's on that, yeah. Good, uh, good clarification. Um, so again, I'm not running a jail, but if, uh, if you wanted to just directly enslave this VXLAN interface with an IP on this toast, that would, uh, that would work. And he's not being strange. So any th well, we'll just go through these real quick. So OpenBSD. Works as well. And uh, just show you Fedora. <coughs> has multiple interfaces for some reason. And there's also not working. All right. Um, anything else you'd like to see in particular? Not, to, not too glamorous on the demo side, but. questions. Okay, thanks a lot.